Lord God, we, uh, we thank you for your grace. I thank you for all that you are. Um, Lord, I pray that uh, these, this time here together is a time that you would be heard, um, that you would speak to all of us um, through your word, through your teachings um, of your scripture that you have given to us, um, and that through that, Lord, we would better know who you are, uh, who we are, and um, in that it would change the way that we live and the way that we act. And so God, be with us in, during this time here together. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to be looking at what is man, broader sense, what is mankind. Um, so what, what, um, how God created us, um, how he created us for the glory of God. We'll jump into false teachings because I did think actually it may it transition pretty well as we look at um, to the glory of God. It actually is a good segue to look at some of the things as to why false teachings, uh, how, to, how to identify them and, and how they can be so hurtful for us if our, if our goal is to glorify God, um, then, then why those false teachings would be so dangerous for that. And then we'll look at the broken image <clears throat> as to how we are made in the image of God, but how that image has then been broken. So what is man? Uh, after God created the plants and the animals, he had one more thing to create, the pinnacle of his creation. And that's right out of the first uh, paragraph there of the book. Um, so God creates everything, and then he, stop, he, he, he comes to the creation of us pinnacle of this this climax of his creation so he created us in the image of god uh, genesis 1 27 so god created man in his own image in the image of god he created him male and cre- and female he created them <clears throat> and so we see this this distinction in genesis 1 that god created man he created them male and female and this is actually kind of an interesting part as you read scripture you'll realize if you read genesis 1 You'll realize then when you get to Genesis 2, he then creates man. So did he create man twice? It seems to be what Genesis 1, that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are kind of different accounts. And we may have talked about this, but you can tell in Genesis 1, when it says God, it just uses the word, the Hebrew word that means God. But when you get to Genesis 2, that's when it uses the word Yahweh. So it seems clear that Genesis 1 was some ancient writing, maybe from someone who did not know the personal name of God, but was writing of the creation of God, and that, that story got passed on to then Hebrew culture, where Genesis 2 would have been written, and the, more of the story was filled in. So it's just fascinating as you read, I mean, you read Genesis 1 and 2, and every time you read them, something will just be like, that's, I never, never caught that before, that's, that stands out. So it's just amazing how much is in those first two books, but we know he created us in his image, in his likeness. Um, we're not God, but we were created with some kind of likeness of God. And we were created for the glory of God. Uh, God did not need us. And we talked about that when we talked about the attributes of God. It, he wasn't lonely. He didn't need someone to praise him. Um, but we do bring God glory. So Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7 says, Everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, who I'm formed and made and I love, like, there are some things in Scripture where it's like, that's the verse. I mean, it, there's others, but, I mean, what, who I created for my glory. There it is. That's God saying why he created us. And so we were created to, to bring glory to God, which we'll get to on the next slide. And then lastly, we were created with responsibility. Genesis 1.28, and God said to them, so to the male and female that he had just created, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so he gives us this calling to say, I've created all this, I've created you, now you have dominion over all that I have created um, on, on the earth. <clears throat> and so in this is kind of our daily purpose. So like, is there purpose in my job, in my work, in the, in the daily thing I do that doesn't feel like I'm doing the Great Commission and sharing the gospel, it's just my work. Well, your work has been given to you by God to do. It's part of this being fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over it. It's part of this <clears throat> responsibility that he's created us with. But how can we as Christians be responsible in that? Well, that's reading our scripture, knowing how God intends us to live, how, how to be, 
And so in our work, doing it in a way that actually is showing the gospel because it's unique from what the rest of the world may do in their work. While the rest of the world is using their work for greed or selfish gain, we can use our work to serve and to show God to others. So image of God, meaning we, we are to as best we can, although we'll get to the broken image, we're, we're flawed, we're a broken mirror, we're not reflecting God perfectly, but we were created to image God and to show God. Uh, we were played, created to glorify God, to give him the glory for what he has done. And we were created with a responsibility to do what he has called us to do. Um, that is including the Great Commission, go into all the world and share the gospel. But that is also to subdue the earth and, and to have dominion over it. That doesn't mean to abuse it. It means to responsibly take care of it. But, but to do so in a way that has authority. He's, he's given it to us. So it is right for us when we see things in our world that are not the way they should be. It is right for us to be like, we can step in and, and, and work on this issue. So the glory of God. <clears throat> and I think this is kind of the, one of the, the biggest ones. Like, what does that mean? Like, we hear that a lot. Like, give God glory. H- how do we give God glory? So all creation brings glory to God, <clears throat> but we are unique in that we were created in God's image, and our spirit can connect with God and be aware of our giving glory to God. So a tree grows as it's been told to grow by God. God created it. This is your purpose. Grow as a tree. The tree grows. In doing that, it gives glory to God. Now the tree is not aware that it's giving glory to God. It is just simply doing what it was told to do. And so we have this unique situation that God says, here's what I want you to do, my creation. And you are actually aware of me. I have created you, man and woman, in a way that you can have a relationship with me. And so you can actually be aware of that you are bringing me glory. And so God is getting glory by his creation one way or another. Like he created it for his glory. But then there's a beautiful side that we can actually know and, and like, like connect with God in that giving of, of glory. And that is because God gave us a spirit, and he is spirit. And so he's created this way, because um, even like an animal, like, like, like you know, a dog or a cat or a deer or whatever, like it has life, but it doesn't have a spirit that communes with God. It, it may, in some way that we can't comprehend, be glorifying God and be aware of, of its purpose, um, and, and it knows it has a, a, a an, an instinctual purpose, and by doing that, it is glorifying God. But the animal doesn't worship God like we can, and so that's a unique thing that God has given to us. So how do we do that? If that's one of our highest callings, and, and our high actually it is our highest highest calling to bring God glory, how do we do that? Uh, First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 28 through 29 says, Abscribe to the Lord, O families of the people. Abscribe to the Lord glory and strength. Abscribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in splendor of holiness. And then Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8 says, I am Yahweh, that is my name. My glory I give to no other nor my praise to carved idols. And so we see these two verses just kind of affirming this, give glory to God. And him and God actually asking for it, like you are to bring me glory. So ascribe to the Lord, what does that mean? Um, ascribe could mean attribute. So it would be another way to define that word, attribute to the Lord. So to Yahweh, attribute to him, attribute to our God, the glory due his name. So how would we attribute to God the glory due his name. Well, to attribute something is to assign to him who he is. And that's why chapter 2 is so um, important of, like, who is God? Because we need to know who God is so that when we attribute things to him, we're attributing the right things to him. And it's the whole example of if you told me I had black hair, you're attributing something to me that's wrong. And I am not pleased by your glory. You could say all day long how much my black hair is amazing. And I'd be like, you're just making fun of me. Is my hair, like, that's not my hair. And so to attribute things to God that are not true would be not ascribing to him things that are true of him. So we can glorify God by extolling, which would, is an old word that would mean praise enthusiastically, his attributes. 
So as we know things about God, we know he's faithful. We know he's full of mercy. He's full of grace. He's full of love. He has power. He has all knowledge. He is who he is. Those big thoughts of God, those are things that we can worship God with and we can attribute to him and in that we are bringing him glory. So when we say things like, God, your grace is beyond anything in this world. I need your grace. Your grace is perfect. Like that is glorifying God. You are, you are attributing to him a right and true thing about him. And this can happen um, during our entire life, or like during our entire day. Like it doesn't have to be a special moment. It's just as we think of God, we are attributing to him the things that are right of him. Um, but one way that it is most clearly, I think, seen is in our, our praise and our worship, these moments where we are singing or speaking things of him. Um, and we, we're speaking of his magnificence, his grandeur, his holiness. And when we're, we're saying these things, these, those are moments where we are bringing him glory. It is not glory that, like, again, he already has all he needs, but in affirming who he is, in us affirming who he is, we elevate his name and bring him glory. And so if you want uh, more, a, a much longer read on that, there's an article linked there, gotquestions.org um, slash glorifying God. Um, you can, that, that website is pretty good, gotquestions.org. Um, they've answered like 400,000 questions on Christian faith. Some of them are kind of duplicates of each other. Um, they do have different writers. So every now and then I find one that's maybe not quite to where I'd want it to be, but what they do a very good job of is here's the scripture. Very similar to this book. Like here's the answer, scripture, 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 scripture. So you can always read them yourself and find out. So I have found that helpful in a lot of cases when you run into questions that this book didn't answer and you just you don't know where to find them in this in the Bible. Um, I've used that website a lot of times as a resource. And then we'll jump into now a an idea of what would be false praise. Like what is what is why is this so important? Um, kind of picking up from a conversation we started uh, last week about um, you know, false doctrines and things like that. So if this is our job to, to glorify God, to elevate him, and, and especially when we are, you know, we only gather on Sundays for one hour, <laughs> not two. <laughs> that, that hour should be a moment of, like, let's, let's be you know, serious. Like, we are here to glorify God, to worship and praise him. So I want to share with you a clip that um, this was just one that really kind of made me like uh, open my eyes to some of the stuff that Bethel was doing that just didn't sit right. Um, and this is actually a clip that they, so they actually took this three minute clip and posted it on their YouTube site. This isn't like, oh, I went and found the one little clip. Like this is something that they've posted saying we're completely fine with this. So just listen to it. And, and this is them taking communion as a church and just, you know, do you, do you see anything that's off in this? When I take the broken bread, the body of Jesus, there are certain confessions that I like to make over the whole communion time. I usually take probably 20 minutes or sometimes even 30 minutes for it. We only have a few, so we'll have to abbreviate. But I want to at least give you an idea of my approach. When I hold the bread, the body of Jesus, I like to make a confession. By your stripes, I was healed. By the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. It's extremely important that we begin to contend for what Jesus made provision for, and that is the subject called divine health. I've stated it before, it would be tragic to come to the end of time and have the only generation that lived in divine health to be Israel in the wilderness, not born again in rebellion against God. They had a period of time where they were in divine health. Clothing didn't even wear out. I believe it is the provision of the Lord in his suffering on our behalf. Jesus bore stripes in his body through brutal beating as an atoning work to deal with the power of sickness and disease. So I'm going to ask if you would just stand with me. We're going to make some bold confessions, proclamations together. By the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. 
By the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. When I do this, I purposefully bring to mind people that need miracles in the body, people that I know, people that are either family members or dear friends. And what I like to do is take this moment to come before the Lord and to make that bold confession by the stripes of Jesus. And then mention their name. By the stripes of Jesus, Mark is healed of cancer. We're not talking mind over matter. We're not doing mental gymnastics. We're declaring a reality that has not yet been fully experienced. And I want to. And so I, I take that moment and I just make the proclamation. By the stripes of Jesus, cancer is defeated in Mark's body. By the stripes of Jesus, deafness is defeated in that man or that woman. By the stripes of Jesus, Parkinson's is gone in Alan's body, in Kathy's body. We make these decrees, these confessions. I want you to do it right now over a family member or a friend, two or three that you can think of that just need a miracle. I want you just to see the broken body of Jesus as more than enough for the problem they're facing. Do it right now. If you're joining us at home on Bethel TV, if you're able to join with us, do the same thing. Do the same thing. Just make the confession, the proclamation by the stripes of Jesus. Kathy was made healed, made well. By the stripes of Jesus, Brenda was made whole. By the stripes of Jesus. Just make those confessions, proclamations. By the stripes of Jesus. Now I want you to hold this body of Jesus in front of you. Lord, we give you thanks that you were willing to suffer the way you did, to disempower disease, infirmity, and afflicting spirits. I thank you for this right now in Jesus' name. So, I'm curious. Like, what, so what's the, you know, I mean, obviously there is something wrong. But like what, because he's very well-spoken. It, it seems Christian. But what, is there anything you picked up on? Like what, what were some of the issues in what he was saying? Because it's not wrong to ask for healing. But he died for our sins. Yeah. That's his communion. That's not, I don't, it's not like the proper, those parts shouldn't be going together, should they? Right. Yeah. When he said confession at the beginning, I thought he was going to confess sin. Yes. What makes it so, because again, is it wrong to ask from healing? Would it even be wrong to pray from healing from the stage? No. But you're taking communion. Like, like you guys all just said, like, I was expecting him to be like, no, let's talk about our sins. No, let's not worry about your sins. Let's just get you healed. Right. <clears throat> and it's like, that's, that's abusing the sacrament of communion. So yeah, I mean, it's, it, is communion in remembrance of our of our salvation, of what Christ did, or is it about divine health? There, there's no scripture that says communion is about divine health. There's not even a scripture that talks about divine health. That's a made up word. That's a doctrine that they they've created. <clears throat> so he he kept saying, and by his stripes we are healed, and and that is, and, and that's one thing. This is where like again, like you guys picked up on it. Oh yeah, that something wasn't right, but like. There's hundreds of thousands of people that watch that and go, that's Christianity. And so this is why we need to know truth, because he's using Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Healed of what, though? In context. And if you go and read Isaiah 53, the whole thing is about our depravity and our sin. So certainly, he didn't say... I've saved you from hell. I've died for your sin. Oh yeah, and I died on the cross so you could feel better and go to hell. Because I'm going to take your cancer away, but you still have your sins. Right. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's the heresy in it. Yeah. Is that people, and I do believe there could be genuine Christians at that church, but most of them are probably being drawn in by the idea of, I want to have a good life now. And when Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me, 
that's not a good life now. That may mean living with cancer until you die of it for the glory of God. Like, that's the contrast. So, and I think you get, we pretty much said this, but like, it, Jesus did not suffer and die so we could be temporarily healed of disease. He saved, died so that we'd be eternally saved from sin. Can Jesus his, heal us physically? Yes, but that's not what his death purchased. Um, I think the teaching we've been doing on Sunday mornings through Mark has been hugely helpful with that. Like, all the healings that Jesus did, like, yes, he healed. And then he always, like, but that's not what it's about. That's to prove to you that I am God. Now, look what I'm going to do to save you eternally. And so it, they always reverse it. They take, we're saved as Christians, now we get Jesus' divine health. That's, that's nowhere in the scripture. scripture was always he healed, and then like, you're forgiven of your, uh, of, your, of your sins. Or it was always like, it was always hand in hand with that. So I, I show you that, because um, that's, those are the things that come out of Bethel Church. And again, you sit there and watch one of their two and a half hour live streams, but you might get to the end of it and be like, eh, seemed okay. <laughs> because you can't for two and a half hours be like, okay, what did he say there? Like you're not, you, you're, you're wanting a pastor to teach you truth and you're hoping that you can just let that sink in and not have to be critical of every word. Um, but when a church cuts out a clip, again, it wasn't like, this was somebody on YouTube that went like, oh, they said this. Like, that was on their own YouTube channel from 2019. Like, that was something they posted as like, look at this. Um, so it's clearly the message they want to share. So then when we get to the songs that we sing, um, and, and we're getting into my personal convictions at this point, so please feel free to not agree with me. Um, <laughs> these are, I mean, you can feel free not to agree with me at any point, but if I'm speaking from scripture, then maybe I have a little more backing. This is more of getting into personal uh, convictions. So these are three things. Um, I borrowed these from some other sites that have looked into this, but these are three things that I get with a song is what are the, do the lyrics line up with scripture? So is what I'm singing close to singing scripture? Because if I'm singing something that's not scripture, as we all know, songs get stuck in our head. So I don't want songs stuck in my head that aren't scripture. I'd rather have scripture stuck in my head if that's going to be the case. Um, how would an outsider interpret this song? Uh, obviously, like songs of worship are, are for us as Christians to reflect on God, but it should also be evident, um, as Paul talks about in the New Testament, like if, an, if somebody were to walk into your church service, would they see Christ glorified or would they see you glorified? And he actually uses this when he's talking about like the gift of tongues and stuff, and he's like, you know, if you, speak in, if you speak in a tongue and there's no interpreter and somebody walks in, they're going to think you're insane. Like, what is, what is happening in here? Because they're not going to understand. And so, th this, so I think with our songs, it should be the same. If, somebody, if you're inviting somebody to church and you're singing a song, should the gospel not be clear in the song? Like, they're going to be saying, oh, here's all these Christians. They're singing these words. What are they singing about? So, and then the last one, what does the song glorify? Does it, does it lift up an idea, a, a positive thought? Does it lift up us? Or does it truly lift up and glorify God? And so um, I have a couple examples. And, and again, I'm not saying any of these songs are songs you can't listen to. Actually, several of these. I, one of them I had on my playlist for four years. And just, to, just today as I was working on oh, yes, as I was working on this, there was a line that stood out to me. I'm like, this seems weird. <laughs> So like I'm not like I want you, I want I'm hoping through this you'll like you'll, you'll leave with oh, I should think about what I'm listening to, especially when it's Christian because when it's Christian you're kind of letting it pour into you. But I what I don't want to have happen is you become so critical that you can't worship anymore. Because I found myself in that for for a while of just like I was getting so deep into these things that every church service I was just studying the lyrics and not worshiping. So here's the first one I looked at. Uh, you Make Me Brave, Brave by Bethel. I mean, again, is there anything in the song that I would say, oh yeah, it's an awful song? No. I mean, it, it, seems to be, it's, it seems to be positive. It seems to have Christian lingo in it. Um, it seems to, you could say in a way, it has a biblical message. Um, but there's a line that says, the champion of heaven, you made a way for all to enter in. I'm like, that's, yeah, that's, that's Jesus, our salvation into heaven. But you know that just because of the context of that's the meaning you brought to it. Why not clarify Jesus? You were the way into heaven. Like, so again, it's, 
songs often get very poetic and that's fine the psalms are full of poetry but i just get careful of like could 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 another religion sing that who's the champion of heaven well there's a lot of religions that have a heaven and they have their their prophet of heaven their champion of heaven and they all have a way to enter in so again could you sing that absolutely is there anything wrong with singing that no but that's just where i get like okay so is this a song I should sing on church on a Sunday morning? Is this glorifying God? I personally am convicted. I could be more specific. I know God on, like, we've, we've studied things about God that, like, I could certainly say some words in a more powerful way. Like, if this is my hour on a Sunday to lift up a word to God and, like, praise him for who he is, I don't know. So that, those are just kind of some things I look at. And then the song repeats i mean when you get to the chorus it's just you make me brave you make me brave you make me brave call me out beyond the shores into the waves you make me brave you make me brave no fear can hinder now the promises you made you make me brave you make me brave you make me brave and so there's a repetitive trancing to the song of you make me brave now we do see repetitive in scripture we see holy 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 hallelujah so when we're praising god i think yeah you could repeat it because you just yeah you're holy and you're holy <laughs> and you're holy to me that's worship but when you're saying you make me brave you make me who, you see the shift who, who you're talking about you now and then you leave this song going i'm brave like so what and, and you'll leave this you'll leave this song going like I, i'm motivated and that's where i'm like it's okay like if you listen to this song and, and this song is a positive song to where like it helps you that's fine. Just realize it, it may not be a song of worship to God. It, it could be, but just be careful with it. Um, I, I've noticed in Bethel, a lot of Bethel songs, and just a lot of like songs in general, they like to talk about God singing over us. There's a lot of attention of God doing something for us. There's a lot of focus on what we get from God. There's a lot of repetition of lines, and a lot of times the lines that are being repeated, like, Okay, what's that, what's that line saying? What's that line giving glory to? So a lot of times I find in, in a lot of Christian songs, um, it's, it's more reflective on me. And so again, like I have a lot of songs in my playlist that are those types of songs. They are songs that I listen to. Maybe I just, you know, listen to the words. It's a hard day. Like they're just good songs that kind of encourage me. But I also have come to know that those songs are not songs of worship to God. And so if all my music, all my Christian music is just songs talking about how I'm okay, I'm never worshiping God until, and maybe that song produces a time of worship after, of like, thank you, God, for, for doing this. Um, but that's just where I want us to be careful of, like, our songs of worship should be expressing reverence and adoration to God. So one more um, here from Bethel, No Longer Slaves. This is the one that I just saw yesterday. I've, I've listened to this song hundreds of times. And I just... You know, you unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song. And I was just like, at first I was like, what, what does it mean to unravel me with a melody? Like, what's, what are you unraveling? And is the melody unraveling me? Like, and it, so that first line actually to me is like, wait, is it just because the song has this melody and I'm being unraveled by it? Like, is that, okay. <laughs> And then it says, you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies. And at first I was like, is that even in the Bible somewhere? <laughs> but it is. Psalms 32, 7, you are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. I'm like, huh. Okay, it is in scripture. And actually every single one of these lines, you can actually almost find a verse. And then I've noticed that they like, it's almost like they take all the good verses in the Bible and shake them up. And then they, there's our song. Because let's, you know, I'm no longer a slave to fear. And I'm like, wait, but sin would be better. Sin would be a better word there. Like, I'm no longer a slave to sin. I am a child of God. But okay. So we're talking about fear. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your blood, blood flows through my veins. <clears throat> again, I was like, that's, that's very, like, doctrine of election. Like, from my mother's womb, you chose me. Like, that's, that's kind of, but then I'm like, I know that's not their theology. I know the, the writers of this song, that's not what they meant. And then I actually found that when you pull this up, mother is capitalized. I'm like, what's that mean? 
And a lot of people don't know what it means. It could have been a typo, but they also do, there are some of their teachings that seem to talk about how we are mini gods. Like we are, we are like Jesus, like we are Jesus. We are, we are a, a, not a child, we are not a child of God and as a redeemed child of God, but we are mini gods. And so then you read like from my mother's womb. So from God's womb, I have been chosen. So I'm a, I'm, I've been chosen from God's womb Love has called my name. I've been born again. Your blood flows through my veins. So when I hear that, I just think of communion symbolically, like saved by his blood. But if they're reading that literally, then they're saying, no, like my blood, I was born, like I am God and his God, his blood is in my veins. So I'm just like, this whole song is unraveling for me. <laughs> if, if it's sung in that way, then, then absolutely. And like even the one we were talking about last week with like reckless love, like I knew people were like, no, like I don't. When I say reckless love, I don't mean like God is reckless. I just mean like I perceive it as reckless from my view, even though I know he's in control. And I'm like, that's fine. But for me, I'm just like, I'd just rather say the word that I mean then. <laughs> um, so, um, so, yeah, what, so what I kind of got from this song as I kind of went through it is like, so, yeah, we, we are being saved from fear. And again, that is a very biblical thing, but this... This is not necessarily, again, to somebody who's not a Christian, this is not necessarily like mm-hmm. talking about the gospel. Um, and, and so I guess just to contrast this, I have one more that I just wanted to look at real quick. So this was a song um, called All I Have is Christ. And so again, when it comes to songs of worship, like if there's a song that I want to sing and I can just get behind every line, this is one that just glorifies God. It spells out the gospel. So the, very, the first verse is a clear message of our sin. I was lost. I, th- I thought I knew, um, but the sin that promised joy in life um, had led me to the grave. And so it's this acknowledgement of like everything I thought was good is actually leading me to the grave. I had no hope. Um, I was a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. And so... That, to me, just echoes sin. And then the second one is now this, this um, why we needed Christ. Because um, I, was, I was running hell-bound, indifferent to the cost. I looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. I behold God's love displayed. You suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. Now all I know is grace. And then we do get to a repetitive part of the song. Hallelujah, all I have is Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus is my life. And that's repeated over and over as the chorus. But again, we are repeating a hallelujah, which is God be praised. So again, a song of worship, God be praised. All I have is you, Christ. God be praised. You are my life. God be praised. And then uh, now, Lord, I would, and and this is, I think, like, so we've had the, we've we've had this reflection of sin. We've had this, this moment, and now we have this beautiful moment of, like, joy and reflecting in that. And now there's an action of, like, now, Lord, I am yours alone, um, Strength to follow your commands that could never come from me. Oh, Father, you ransom my life any, any way you choose and let my song forever, my only boast is you. And so now there's a change and now there's a going in that. And so um, that, that for me, like that would be a song of like, that's a song of adoration and worship. Um, so That's really cool. Yeah, it it's is. really cool to see the contrast. I agree. Okay. Yeah, this song to the other two. Yeah. Very clear, and that's perfect. Because, yep. yeah, I mean, like you said, like, other songs aren't bad, but I really like how you can see the difference that one is more me focused, and this one is more God focused. Yep. So, that's all I can, all I can ask. <laughs> it is, is just to see that distinction. Mm-hmm. That there are good songs that are Christian, but be careful. Yeah. Don't build your theology on a song. And then there are songs that you're like, that's worship. Like every line, God can work through the words of fools. <laughs> he, he, he works through me, uh, I hope. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it, it's, it, it's one of those things where it's like, just, just know what you're listening to and, and know what you're pouring into you. Because no, there is no one's perfect. We are not God. That's why we look to God. Because every song is written by a human author, and so there could be a flaw. Um, Every book is written by a human author, so there could be a flaw. 
this is written by God, and so there is not a flaw. Are there translations? Yes, and we talked about that, but you can go back and you can find out what the word was. <laughs> if you're not sure, you can, you, can, you can look into it. So all that um, to say we are a broken image, and so this is where I, we, we and I, I need to have grace of like, you know, I, I, I look at Bethel Church, I, I see there's heresy that is said from their stage, things that I would say, that's just not, that's very dangerous and not biblical. But that doesn't mean there's not grace for those that go there and those that maybe serve there that just haven't seen that yet. We are all broken. Um, so sin has distorted us. Uh, God's image in us is not clearly seen as it once was. And this is why we all um, need God. Uh, we need this image to be restored to um, what it was intended to be. And so in uh, Colossians 3.10, it says, the, uh, this image is being restored, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So there's this, re this renewing of our image um, Romans 8.29, being conformed to the image of his son. So as Christians, we are being conformed to, to Christ's image. 2 Corinthians 3, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is spirit. And so all these things is kind of, we'll get to this in a later part in the book, but sanctification is the big biblical word that we've put to identify this process of us becoming more like Christ. So we know we're sinful, we know there was a, we, we encountered Christ, we knew his grace, and then he starts working in us in this slow process of rebuilding the mirror, and it won't ever be perfect, because even as you rebuild a broken mirror, it's still broken. And so that's kind of the life that we're living now. Now until the day we die, we're in this process of sanctification, that we're becoming more like Christ, we'll never be like Christ, but we're becoming more like him. And as the Spirit works inside of us. And then one day, because of Jesus' work on the cross, we will, at the end of time, as God's children, become like his Son. 1 Corinthians 15, 49. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. And we'll talk more about this in a future chapter as well, but this would be the idea of glorification, that there will then be a day after we die, after this body falls away, and only our spirit is left, that Christ will then... Um, bring us into a new image to be like him, this, this perfected form of who we were meant to be in glorification. So that is the who we, who we are, what we were made to do. We were made to bring God glory in all that we do, um, which is why I think it's so important that we um, are careful with what we say and what we, what we take in so that we properly give God glory um, for who he is. And then in light of all that, knowing that we're broken and that we, we want to know perfect. We want to be perfect and we want to know absolute truth, but to know that we're broken. And so there's this, our, our lives right now are in search of this, you know, what, what is truth? And there's, I still have questions and I still don't know what this looks like. And, and so it's in a quest of that truth. And it's also this, this changing of who we are to try to become, and, and we can't do it. It's again, it's Christ. Christ is the one who is changing us through his spirit um, to become more like him. So what is sin? What is sin? What's the origin of sin? Uh, following up on a question from a couple weeks ago, can the angels sin again? Is it, can, did you ask that? Yeah. It was actually kind of funny. It was actually in my notes from three years ago. So it's not the first time. <laughs> um, our, what is our sinful nature and then what is the penalty of sin? So what is sin? The book's definition is sin is any failure to conform to the moral law of God in act, attitude, or nature. So to define those a little bit more, in act, sin is found in any action that is contrary to God's moral law. So what we, what we do, um, and that's, I think, clearly seen, Ten Commandments. That's a very practical, like, don't do these things. Um, but it's also in our attitude. Sin is found in the, attitude, the attitudes that are contrary to God's moral law. That's what we think, what goes through our mind which is where it gets really scary and ugly because people don't see our thoughts and we know our thoughts and we know our thoughts are much worse than our actions. 
Um, so we consider Jesus' words in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 through 48, where he's like, you've heard it said this, I tell you this. You know, I've, you've heard it said, do not murder. I tell you, if you hate your brother, you've, you've committed the sin already. Like, so he's, Jesus is getting at this idea of the mind, that if you've, if you've, your, your mind can be in sin against God. And then in nature, and I think this is kind of the hardest one because it's the default one. It's, it's in our nature. Sin is found in our nature, the inner character of who we are. Ephesians 2, 3. We all, once were, we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We were by nature children of wrath. And so God hates sin because it directly contradicts everything that he is. Therefore, Jesus says, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect which we know is just an impossible call of Jesus saying, you must be perfect. And we're like, but we can't be perfect. We're only perfect through grace because Christ paid for our sins and he was perfect for us. And then our only hope on the day of judgment is for his perfection to stand true. And so where did, our, where did sin come from? I think this is this kind of, it's the origin of sin and we can say the origin of evil. Like if sin is something we deal with, but God is a good, perfect God, then where, where did this even come from? Um, so since sin is anything contrary to who God is, <laughs> since sin contradicts God, um, that's just kind of a, uh, take a step back. Like if, so sin is contrary to God. God says, Jesus says, be perfect as, my, as the Father is perfect. Okay, so that means God is the definition of perfect. So that means whoever he is, he's not sinful because whatever he is, is what's right. He sets the def- that's kind of a hard thing to realize. Like, when we say God is good, well, whatever God does is good because he is the definition. Like, he, he, he controls the definition of what is good. And so when it comes to sin, sin is just merely... For the, sta- the standard, I guess would be another way to look at it. Too. Yeah, the standard. Like, the bar is here. <laughs> <laughs> right. He, he, he was God. He was there before anything existed. So when it was just him, that was... That was there. So everything he's created, like... Anything that goes against who I am, that's, that's sin. And that's, that's kind of where that comes in. So sin is anything that contradicts God. Um, that's why God cannot sin. And he cannot be the originator of sin because it's not who he is. He, if, if he had sin, then he would be sinful and therefore like, it, it would not be wrong to sin because it would be who God is. <laughs> and it wouldn't be a contradiction to who he is anymore. And so, um, so that, this is going to be one of those like Trinity type things where we're going to we're going to bring up two sides, and, and they're not going to really connect. Um, so God's work is perfect and just. Um, God cannot even desire to do wrong. All of his desires are good, and he is the very standard for good. So again, like if God desires something, he's God, and so his desire is good because he's God. No, you can't tell God, God, that's a bad thought because he's like, I'm God. My thoughts are good because I am the standard of that. So there... You can't, there, God can't do anything that is, that is um, against who he is. I mean, we can look back to, you know, the, the, the story of in creation in the garden. Everything's good. Creates man and woman. They're good. And he creates the tree of knowledge and the good and evil. And he does not, it, it does not say that that tree is bad. Because he creates the garden and he says all is good. So the tree of knowledge of good and evil is good in God's eyes. And God says, don't eat from that tree. It's got knowledge of good and evil, but don't eat from it. So it's so sin is our looking at, at you know here here's everything that hap- everything we have, and God says don't don't do this. And, and, and so yes, there is a sense of like God didn't in, in that story God didn't force Adam and Eve to eat from the tree. Satan didn't even force Adam and Eve to eat from the tree. Yeah. Because the tree did not contain knowledge that God didn't already have. And all God's knowledge was good knowledge. It just con- contained this knowledge that yeah, they should not have had. And, and ultimately in them doing it, was their knowledge of good and evil, like, is the knowledge of good and evil sin? Fine. Not fine. necessarily. It was their disobedience. And that, that lines up well, cause like, because we have the knowledge of good and evil that we weren't created to fully handle. So now we deal with sins because we have knowledge beyond what, he created us to, to, do, to do. And so that's the beautiful day to come of where, hey, we're going to create a new heavens and a new earth and you'll have a new body and, and, and there will be a perfected, proper balance of 
what you will know and what your body will be able to to deal with. But we, we must not blame God um, for sin. And and why? The script, because the scripture, Deuteronomy 32, 4, the rock, his work is perfect. All of his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. Let no one say when he is tempted that I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. James 1, 13. That's... That's a hard verse because sometimes in our life we're like, oh, is God testing me? Like, and he may, be, he may be orchestrating things to, to develop you, but he's not going to tempt you. And I know that's, cause that's been a struggle. Like sometimes I'm like, oh, I feel like this sin in my life, God's putting this sin in my life to test me, like to tempt me with it. But, but he, he's not doing that. Now, is he allowing evil in the world to have is he is he allowing in his sovereignty and and because again he's in control could he snap his fingers or could he speak (laughs) and yes so that that's that's the tension of like he does have power to intervene Our, our wills will never overpower his will if he chooses like yeah we make real choices but the tension is he could overpower our will because if he couldn't, then we're more God than he is. Like, like we, we have to be careful with those things and, and allow that, that tension of like, he could, but he doesn't. And because he's good, that means the fact that he's not means he has something he's going to show us one day, most likely in heaven, that when we see, we'll be like, okay, all that, all that pain um, had a purpose. And its purpose was for a greater good and a greater glory to God that otherwise would, would not be there. Um, and that's, that's hard right now to get our minds around, and, and our hope is, okay, there is a day to come when, when, when he will make all things right, and we, when we, will, we will see this, this experience through a lens that, that no longer has that, that tension. Um, so yeah, the, the last the last section there is just you know sin in, sin existed in Satan and his demons the falling angels we talked about last week before Adam and Eve sinned um, we we make that because when the serpent te- uh, tempted Adam and Eve which we see pretty clearly to be Satan that obviously he must have fallen before he did that tempting um, and so that's kind of where that comes in that Satan fell and, and the angels fell before before that. The time frame, the timeline, we don't know, but that's just kind of something with that. So it, it does beg the question, like we, we ran into, can angels sin? If, if some of the angel, if, if Satan himself sinned and some of the angels fell with him and became demons, what does that mean for the rest of the angels? Like, like could, could there be more falling? And so th- this is what we have in Scripture to, to look at. Um, Timothy 5, 21, it says, I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism. Um, our, our biggest clue there is that he calls them the elect angels. He doesn't just say angels. He says the elect angels. And so it seems, um, as we look through more parts of Scripture in the Bible, that God's holy angels are elect, meaning he has chosen them in some way. Um, he has set them aside. He's elected these angels. Um, so perhaps God at one point gave all angels a one-time choice, follow me or follow Satan. We don't know. There's no scripture on what that moment looked like. Um, but we do know that some sinned and followed Lucifer and are lost and condemned. Um, and those that chose to remain loyal to God are secured in that decision. And we, we have to just rest with that because the Bible gives us no reason um, to believe that angels would sin again one day. There, there's no scripture. The only scriptures we see are angels doing the work of God as elect angels set aside by God to do his work. Um, there's nothing in scripture that gives us belief that more angels will fall in, in a time to come. And so we have to be content knowing that, yes, there was a falling at some point. But it seems now, after that, in some mystery in heaven, that we don't know exactly how it went down, that after that, 
Um, God has now has his elect angels that he is keeping and he is ensuring. And that's where we get into the whole will thing. Like it seems like now these angels, he's like, no, you will not turn against me. Like you, you will, you will um, always worship me. And so these bullet points here are just some examples throughout scripture where we do see moments where God chooses something. He, he, he intervenes into the will and, and he creates something for himself. He chose Abraham to be the father of many nations. He chose Israel to be his specific and special people. He chose Mary to be the mother of Jesus. I mean, what, like, Mary didn't do anything to deserve that. And just, hey, Mary, <laughs> like, like, God was the one who orchestrated that one. Um, he chose the 12 disciples to live, with the, um, to live with the Lord Jesus for three years and to learn from him. I mean, Jesus walked around and was like, follow me. Okay. <laughs> like, like, we see these moments in Scripture where we see God's will overpowering our will of, of him coming into these, these, these situations. Uh, he chose Paul to bring the gospel to many, both personally and through his writings. I mean, that's a crazy story of Paul killing the church. Jesus appears before him. Why are you persecuting my people? And then Paul <laughs> gives his life and, and writes most of the New Testament. That's, that's God intervening into what was Paul's will. Paul's will was to persecute the church, to be a sinner. Jesus steps in. No, I'm giving you a new will, <laughs> a new heart. I'm taking out that heart that wants to destroy me. I'm going to give you a new heart. Now you're going to follow me. And, and then you can just read Paul's writings and like, well, did, so God was Paul just a robot doing God's will? No, read the New Testament. <laughs> Look at Paul's heart that God, God changes the heart. And now Paul's like, I can't help but not love God because I've seen him. Uh, so in the same way, um, God has chosen out of every tribe and language and people and nation, Revelation 5, 9, to come to faith in Jesus. Those whom he chooses will come to him and he will never cast them out. And so when we look at the angels, it, it seems like, yeah, he, he could very well have allowed that falling to happen for a, 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 mis, a reason in heaven that we don't have in scripture. Um, but he allowed that to happen. And then since then, again, there's no scripture to tell us otherwise. So it would seem that the few scriptures that we have, Timothy 5.21 being one of those, that God has now secured um, the angels um, for, for the purposes that they will do. Um, and, and I think it's, it's healthy to rest in some of those things because, of course, we could ask 10 more questions. But it's speculation. And, and that's, where we, that's where we get into dangerous places of, of making such heavy doctrinal type statements that we don't have scripture to, to, to back us up on on that. So we have to look at what we see in scripture and, and use that to, to, to come to rest on a few things. A couple more. So <coughs> sinful nature, um, we touched briefly on this, but this idea that we are born into sin, I think that's one of the hardest things of like, does that mean we're born into sin? Like, don't I have to choose to sin and then I'm a sinner? But scripture seems to say like we were, we were born in this, this already deceitful turning against God. And so we have Romans seven eighteen that says, For I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh, for the desire to do what is good is with me, but there's no ability to do it. And so Paul's like, I want to do good. I got no ability to do it. So, like, so this is like the best case scenario. You actually do know what's good but you can't do it because this is the apostle Paul <laughs> and he's like I, I know what's right and I can't do it and, and what is he getting at here he's like I need Christ to work through me I need Christ to work through me to do anything that's good and so it's Paul coming to this confession even as a Christian he's just like this flesh is just weighing me down like it's preventing me from doing I've read the scripture. He's like, I know what I should do, but this flesh is keeping me from doing it. And so what was Paul's thing? He was just with Christ all the time. Just like, I need you to work through me. And then Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is more deceitful than anything else. It's incurable. Who can understand it? Uh, Psalms 51, 5, indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. And that's, that's one of the... Uh, 
hardest verses of this, like, sinful when I was conceived, like, born in iniquity. Like, like what, what do we do with that? Like, we, we, we inherited this sin from Adam. Um, and, and, and David here is saying that, you know, I was guilty when I was born. And then one more, Psalms 58.3 says, The wicked go astray from the womb. Liars wander about from birth. And I, and I think it, for most of us, like, we can kind of see, like, you don't have to teach the child wrong. Like, like there's just a natural bend that they seem to have to want to go astray from the earliest ages. Um, I mean, it, and, and so, like, you know, that, that does raise some questions. Um, but it, it's important for us to realize that that's our default. And that's what I want. That's what the sinful nature is supposed to show us: is that people aren't good, heaven-bound people until they sin. People are hell-bound people until Christ saves them, until they encounter salvation, until they accept Christ. And so that's that's needed because that's the, without this, you have. And I've heard people. I've I don't sin. Like, like I'm remaining under the default, I'm without sin. And, and, those, and that's where you have to go, like, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. So, okay, we actually need to take a step back. Let's look at the Ten Commandments. Let's, let's look at what Jesus said. Do you think you've done any of these things? Oh, yeah, I've done that. Well, then you've sinned. And, and one sin is, it, like, it's all. So, like, so that's where, you know, sinful nature is important for, for people to realize. Like, it's not do enough good and just keep the scales balanced. It's like, no, you started off already needing a savior. So again, sinful nature, let's just keep hammering in, right? All have sinned. So we inherited Adam's sinful nature and his guilt damned from the start before we ever made a choice. But it seems clear through scripture. Romans 5.12, sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. By the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Go into the Old Testament, First Kings. There is no one who does not sin. The psalmist. There is no one who does good, not even one. And then the Romans Road, classic 3.23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then First John 1 John 1.8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So, for the person who says they are without sin, that's, that's the verse. <laughs> the Bible actually calls that out specifically. Like, if you think you haven't sinned you're just deceiving yourself and so the bible makes it clear all have sinned all have sinned and fall short of the glory of god that's why the, the romans road has become that because like that verse encapsulates that whole thought um and then we go one one more uh step with that of this idea of total depravity so even if there was a dire, desire to do what right and paul like we just read from paul like I, I i desire to do what right but i can't do it so even if a person had the desire to do what was right. We were unable to do it. This is the idea of total depravity, which is a, is a, a word, again, that we use to define a bigger idea in Scripture, um, which you could define as just being morally corrupt or, or completely morally corrupt. Like just, just, there's a complete corruption in us um, that separates us from God. So Romans seven eighteen, For I know that, I, that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do right, but not the ability to carry it out. And just, again, reading there from, from Paul, um, that he, he uses this confession of, like, there's, there's nothing good in, the, in this flesh. And then Romans three ten through 11, uh, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. So this is this repetiting from, from the, the book of Romans of this, no one seeks God. I think that's one of the, the hardest things, too, is like, no one seeks God. Like, not only do we all sin because none of us desire to do what's, like, even if you desire to do what's good, you can't do good because you're all, we're all falling under sin. And so even our best works are filthy wrecks. <laughs> even when we're like, we did something good, we helped the environment, and God's like, it's all filthy rags because you've missed You've, you've already sinned. You've missed, you've missed my grace. And then Romans in that, Romans 3, no one seeks for God. Like there's not even a seeking of God in a, in a default uh, position of, of man. 
And Jesus continues to affirm this when he says in John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And then he says in Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And so now we, we kind of get a better picture of like a lost world, completely in sin. And then what is God doing? He's coming to seek and save. He's doing the action of coming into a world of people doing what they want to do, trying to raise their own gods, and he's the one coming and bringing, like, I'm going to come seek and save the lost and, and, and draw men and women to me. And then the penalty of sin. So we've sinned against an eternal and infinite God, so the punishment is according to the crime. God is just, and so the punishment is hell a place prepared for those who sinned against God, a place of eternal torment. Romans 6.23, part of the Romans road, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And some have taken these, these, some of these passages that talk about sin is death to just say, oh, if you don't accept Christ, well, you just die, and it's just permanent death. Hell is just destruction. You just cease to exist. Um, and, and people have come up with those theologies because that's a lot easier to accept. Like, oh, if you serve God, you go to heaven. If you don't, you just die. There, there's no God giving you wrath for eternity. Uh, but the problem is, is you have to just scribble out scriptures in your Bible to, to believe that. There are many scriptures that speak of it as a place that sinners go and it being an eternal punishment. And again, Jesus speaks to this clearly. I mean, if, if we're going to hear it from anybody, Jesus himself in Matthew 25 speaks to this. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And some will say, Well, that says hell is prepared for the devils and his angels, not, not, for, not for humans. The problem is, again, the t- context of the entire chapter of 25. Jesus is speaking into context here to those who do not serve him. The devils and his angels gives, just gives us the context that this is the same place, that those who do not follow Christ and the devil and his angels will um, go into the eternal fire prepared for them. And then in Matthew twenty-five forty-six, he kind of continues to clarify it some more. He says, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And now you've got this very clear contrast, eternal life, eternal punishment. Jesus in one verse giving us this idea that either way it's an eternal, like we are an eternal being. It's whether it's eternal punishment or eternal life. And so that's a, a brief um, look at hell. I think we might go into some more later in the book. But just realizing that it is a real penalty for sin. And it is, should be, it is what, like sin and that should convict. That's what helps people see God is the reality of this. And so while it is a hard topic and a hard conversation, and I don't make light of it in any way, but it is something we should figure out like as we share the gospel how do we convey the reality of sin? Because that's what is going to help the gospel grab hold. That's what's going to help them see um, why we care so much. And it should be what motivates us. Like if we could, if we could grasp and, you know, maybe we have moments where we're like, I, I feel the weight of that. But like, wait, I know people that aren't saved. So if I'm not telling them about the gospel, that means I really don't care about them. It means I'm just being selfish. Like, I'm saved, not really worried about you. And letting that convict us of, like, if, if we believe in the reality of eternal hell, then, then we, and, and we know that's the sinful nature, that's the default. So anybody we know that we would have reason to say, like, I, I don't think they're a born-again Christian, I, I should be sharing with them. I should be, like, I should love them. And it's out of love. It's like, I love you so much, I don't want that result for you. And so, um, as Christians, Christ stands in front of us taking that penalty. Galatians 3.13, which is one of a, a beautiful verse. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. I brought the big book. <laughs> um, I, I didn't mark the spot in it, though. So I'll, I'll give you from memory, and then I'll, I'll look into it um, to kind of give you a more complete answer. So there's... There's a, an idea called, what is it, is anybody, the age of accountability. So I've heard that. 
Now, are there scriptures that speak to it? Not super clearly. There's one. For, there's always one from David when his son dies, because God takes him from him, and he, he prays the guy, like, save my son. And he says, um, paraphrasing, that my son will not return to me, but I will return to him. And so people have taken that as David had faith of, my son is dead. God was not going to bring him back to me. But one day when I go to heaven, I'll be with him. And so people have taken that verse to say, like, seems David had faith that he would see his son. Now, we don't know the whole story. Like, like did God give David some kind of peace of, like, I've, I've got your son? Is that the case with every child? We, we don't know. Um, I, I've... I've <laughs> I've had a personal conundrum with, with the idea if, if the age of accountability was absolutely true, meaning it was, it was a doctrinal fact that before age whatever, <clears throat> you go to heaven by default. If, if that was an absolute reality, would it not be graceful to murder children? Like, like Paul says, I wish I could be accursed if it, for your sake. So could, could not somebody be like, you know what, I'll go to hell for being a baby murderer? But all those babies will go to heaven. Like, that just doesn't... When you think about that, like, that's stupid. Like, that is not what the Bible says. And so, like, okay, so what do we do? What do we, what do, we do with a young child or an unborn baby that has not heard the gospel? And I think we, <clears throat> we can be like David, and, and we just, he, he trusted God. And we know that God will not do anything unjust. He's not going to do anything that's not good. He's a good God. Um, and so, I, 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 yeah, I think that's, that's where you have to leave it. I, I cannot make an absolute statement that every young child goes to heaven because it's not in Scripture. It, it's not concrete enough. But I could definitely give hope to say if you've been in a situation or you know someone where, where you've had a child die, and you're like, what, what, was, I, what was I to do? What, what, what were they to do? I had no control over the situation. They died before they could. They died before they, before they were born. They died before they could comprehend me telling them the gospel. I would have told them, but I didn't. We trust God that He's loving and He's good. And, and I think the best comfort is is David. That I know my my child will not return to me, but I'll see them again. And 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 take that for what that is. What God is giving that to you to be. Because, again, it's, it's not one where I could point you to you know, a perfect verse. Oh, right here it says it. But it is one where I think between that, that God can comfort a, a parent who, who has lost a child. All right, well, let me pray for us and then um, let out. Lord God, I thank you for your grace. May we as your people bring you glory. May we find ways to, um, to lift you high. Uh, that may our words be true of you. And may we seek to have uh, truth poured into us. And may we pour out truth to the best of our ability. Um, Lord, we know we are broken people. We know we have sinned. That we were born in iniquity. God, that we have always run against you until you reached down and saved us. And then your spirit living inside of us Lord, has changed us. Um, that we slowly um, become more like you through your grace. So God, I just pray that you would help us. Lord, as we navigate this world, we navigate this life, um, sinning each and every day. And Lord, the more that we come to know you, the more you reveal new sin in our life that we may have never been aware of. Um, so Lord, we know this is something we will, we will deal with until the day we die, until the day that we are with you, and that you make all things new. So God, we thank you for your grace that you keep us and that you hold us um, through our life. So would you be with us this week? Give us opportunities to share your word with others. Give us opportunities to um, be your image bearers, to show your love and grace. So God, we thank you. And it's in your name, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen.